dance floor as you can hear what he has to say. He's with his dance floor, he thinks the world is all over. What up, Net fans? Nets boy here. Bring your latest in your lots to talk about and discuss Brooklyn Nets news. Okay, so it's been a while since my last Nets boy episode. You know, I was going to do an episode after the Mavericks game, but I just figured I would wait until really the end of the halfway point of the season or the all-star break, which is where we are right now. Figured why, why have an episode and then have two games and then talk about basically the same thing I was just going to talk about before. So I waited to the All-Star break, and here we are. Um, and uh, a lot to discuss, so let's go. So the Nets went 5-1 and one those last six games since my last Nets Boy episode. Just looked unbelievably good, um, and their only loss came against a getting better um, and starting to turn into what we thought they would be Dallas Mavericks team. And, of course, it was just James Harden in that game. There was no Kyrie Irving, no Kevin Durant. Kyrie Irving missing time because his surgically prepared shoulder was bothering him, and obviously Durant being out uh, through the All-Star break, which was determined by the Nets, which I knew was going to happen. Like when, I was, when they kept on putting him off and off and off with this hamstring injury, I'm like, they're just going to hold him off until the second half. Like It's as simple as that. So... Was not surprised by that at all. Um, and, yeah, so not surprised that also the one game that they lost was the game against the Mavericks. And, look, the Mavericks have underachieved this year, but they're really starting to figure it out. And, you know, remember, they were a playoff team last year in the Western Conference. They only should be better. I expect them to be in the playoffs now. So, you know, I've talked about this before with this Nets team. As good as all three of those players are, Harden, Kyrie, and KD, it's very clear that they cannot win against the best teams with just one of the two of the th- or one of them. If you have two out of the big three, it seems like they've got a legitimate shot. And we've been seeing the Nets roll with this James Harden, Kyrie Irving, you know, one-two punch with the other guys um, playing well. Um, but you know, and we've like we've seen it before with Harden and Durant and Harden. I mean, and I mean Durant and Kyrie, and now we're seeing it with Kyrie and Harden. It just you just need two out of the three for the Nets to be able to beat anyone on any given night. That's just the reality of it. But one of the three, not against the better teams in the league. So, But overall, a 5-1 and one stretch, those last six games, currently put the Nets at 24-13, and 13, which is a half game behind the 76ers for the best record in the Eastern Conference. So they're currently the second best team in the East. And they're just rolling. They've won nine of their last ten games. They're, the ball is moving. They're getting contributions from everyone, from Landry Shamit to, uh, you know, other players like Tyler Johnson, who's played really well. And um, there's there's somebody else. There's, there's a young kid on the team that, um, you know, just came back after, like, a long time. What was his name? What am I talking about? Nicholas Claxton! <laughs> I told you how great that guy is. I mean... He has been phenomenal in the three games. That's all he's played, by the way, that he has played, being unbelievably efficient, scoring like 16 points in 16 minutes, and playing fantastic perimeter defense, which you do not see from a 6'11 guy, and was bringing tons of energy. And I said it. I, how long have I been talking about Nicholas Claxton this year saying he's the key? He's going to be the, 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 you know, the savior of the Brooklyn Nets back when they were struggling. And I said, he's going to be, he's going to come in. He's going to make me hopefully forget about Jared Allen. Um, though Jared Allen, by the way, is just killing it with the Cavaliers right now. Like, th- like three consecutive, four consecutive games of 20 and 10. Like, good for him. I can got to be happy for him. But Claxton is proving yet again why Sean Marks always seems to know what he's doing. And he's coming in and he has looked great. Look, Claxton is clearly not the strongest guy around. I mean, he's, he's, he's like a twig out there. And there's no denying that he should be a little bit better getting on the rebounding end. But I think that would happen once he gets stronger because he kind of gets bullied a lot. But 
his perimeter defense is what I think separates him and something that I never really thought was going to be this good. His lateral quickness for a guy his size is impressive. And the Nets love to do this constant switching defense. And it's kind of helped the Nets defense. Steve Nash has kind of looked at the team and said, let's just switch all the time. And look, the Nets defense has not been great, but it's been a hell lot better than what it's been earlier in the year. And it's because they're doing this constant switching defense. And Nicholas Claxton is the perfect big for that because of his lateral quickness. But he still has the height to kind of guard taller players. Strength's not quite there yet, but look, I love that Claxton is playing as well as he is. I love that Steve Nash is giving him a chance. Um, of course, it's coming at the expense of Jeff Green, who's still dealing with his shoulder injury, but um, you couldn't be happier about what I'm seeing from Claxton. Um, I just hope he stays in the, in the rotation, because when Jeff Green and Kevin Durant come back, I'm afraid that Nash is going to go back to the small ball lineup and, and still play DeAndre Jordan because, you know, he's best friends with, with Durant. And so they're going to still play Jordan and then they're going to go back to the small ball lineup with Durant and Green and completely forget that Claxton exists. I don't want that. I think Claxton should be in the rotation permanently. Um, and that's not to say that the Nets don't go to the small ball lineup in the future. It's just that maybe you go do it a little less because you have a versatile defender in Claxton who can play the, the center spot. But anyway, loved what I'm seeing from these guys. I love what I'm seeing from this team. And, you know, last episode it was about, is it time to believe in the Brooklyn Nets? And I talked about how it's hard for me as a Nets fan through my history to really believe in this team. And I, I, I hate to say it. I hate, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say this. But I think I finally am believing in this team. I, 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 there's no reason not to. They're not even fully healthy yet, and yet they're still winning nine out of ten games. Like, and now we're hearing rumors about Blake Griffin, or, or you know, because he just got bought out, maybe signing with the Nets. Look, I hate Blake Griffin. He's on my list of most overrated players, people that I hate. But even I, once again, can't deny that he would be an upgrade in the in there and be a very good player for this team if the Nets utilize him as more of a role player than a star player, you know, and then obviously we know about Andre Drummond possibly being bought out. And now there's rumors about the Nets trading Spencer Dinwiddie to get some more, another piece. And I'm all for that. You know, Dinwiddie's not going to play this year really for the Nets. Maybe he might come back at the end, but even when Dinwiddie does come back or in the future, there's no room for him on this team. You've got Harden, you've got Kyrie. There are two heavily ball dominant players where does Dinwiddie fit in? He doesn't. So I'm all for the Nets trading him. So you're hearing about how the Nets could only get better with their team. And you know they're going to add someone in the buyout market. You know whether it's, uh, you know, Blake Griffin or, or Andre Drummond or JaVel McGee or anybody who's going to get bought out in the next couple of weeks. You know the Nets are going to get one of them. And you're seeing the development of Claxton. And you're seeing Landry Shamit figuring it out. And you're seeing... You know, even though he hasn't played that much recently, Jeff Green being playing as great as he is. And and then you remind yourself, Kevin Durant hasn't played in like two weeks. And you're like, oh my God, they're going to get Kevin Durant back soon too. It, it, it's hard not to be excited. It's hard not to be optimistic. It's, it's, it's hard not to finally feel good about being a Nets fan. And this last stretch of games, these last six games – other than the loss to the Mavericks, have made me realize, yes, this team is legit. They don't even have their best player, and they're still winning games. It's very impressive. And, yeah, I, I mean, I don't really have much more to say. I, 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 The first half of the season, my overall, you know, it was a roller coaster of a first half of the season. You know, I started off happy and then got very upset when they were struggling, and then I got crushed when the Nets traded for James Harden. And then I got a little bit happy again, and then I saw them slide a little bit, and now I'm at this point where I'm like, they're tw they're 24 and 13, second best record in the Eastern Conference. They're they're just they're just gonna get better, and I'm very very pleased. And look, I think I got to address the elephant in the room. I th at least what I think is the elephant in the room for myself under this Nets team, and that is obviously my extreme displeasure and poo-pooing of the James Harden trade. Um, we all know it. Did a whole episode about how much I hated the trade and all this stuff. And, 
you know, looking back at what, what, what the Nets are doing now, it is very hard to hate that trade. It really is. You know, was I wrong? I still don't think I'm really wrong for not liking the trade because of the reasons why I did not like the trade. I said this a million times. For me, it wasn't about not wanting James Harden. I just didn't like losing Jared Allen, Karis LeVert, and more importantly, all that draft picks for the next seven years because I was thinking about, obviously, the Paul Pierce, Kevin Garnett trade, Jason Terry trade, and what happened with this team. And, you know, and I said in that episode, all will be forgiven if the Nets do win a championship with James Harden, Kyrie, and Durant, because you'd be like, all right, at least they won. So my hatred of the trade was not, I didn't want James Harden. It was, I didn't want to give up as much as we did for James Harden, though I knew there was really no other option if the Nets were to trade for him. And I just felt that there were better moves that would have been cheaper and less future mortgaging than that trade. So I just want to clarify that. Though at this point, it is very hard to look at this team and say it was a bad move. Because I also talked about how I didn't really see how this team could, you know, create roles with ball-dominant players like Harden and Kyrie. But I'm pleasantly wrong on that one because Harden defers. Harden is the point guard. Kyrie is the shooting guard, and it works really, really well. A lot better than I thought it would. And but that I give more I give credit to both those guys because if both those guys played the way they were playing prior to the trade, as ball dominant as they were, I mean Kyrie was shooting more than Durant every night before Harden was even there, and you know and Harden we all know how much he shot with the Rockets, so it it was you know but they got together and they figured it out. And I love it. And so I do have to admit that part I was wrong on because I was, I said, like, I don't even see how this team could mesh and fit. And now I do. And we've seen it. And even when you drop Kevin Durant back into the mix, I don't expect that many problems. I do think there might be a few issues, might be a little bit of over deference going on. Like, who's that going to shoot at first? I, I, it's not going to be a smooth transition like everyone thinks when Durant comes back. But. I do think it's not going to be that bad. It might just take a couple games to a week for them to figure it all out. I'm more concerned about what happens when Jeff Green comes back with Nicholas Claxton. But we'll see. Um, but like I said, so I do want to address that. with the, and, and that's my address. That address? That is not a word. That is my, that is me addressing, you know, that episode about me being upset. So there you have it, you know. Nets boy, half wrong. But once again, it's to me, it was about what we were losing, what the Nets were losing to get this player who is a top five player in the league and is somebody who I don't nearly hate as much. I will admit to that. I still don't like James Harden. I, I, I'm never going to like James Harden. I don't like his style of play, though it's effective. I don't like... I mean, I don't like people who just take step back threes and refuse to shoot an open shot like he, he, he how many times has James Harden gotten the ball open and pump fakes and then has to dribble through his legs a couple times and then do the step back three but it works so why not you know and I don't like the fact that sometimes he tries to draw the foul more than actually make the shot you know but it works you know I don't like the fact that he really doesn't do any type of mid-range game it's just these floaters but it works so once again, can't get that upset. I just, I just don't like the way he plays, but it works, and the Nets are winning, so why not? I do love his ability to pass the ball. I think he's unbelievably underrated as a passer. I think everyone's seeing that now, and a playmaker. He does turn the ball over a little too much still, because he still gets to be a little too flashy. Um, but I do love the fact that he will get you a basket when he needs to get a basket. And I think the most impressive thing about James Harden at this point, the guy plays. It's as simple as that. The guy plays. He plays every game. He plays 36 minutes every game. He doesn't do load management. He doesn't take time off. He plays. And you got to respect him for that. So I do enjoy that portion of James Harden. I do think it's worth mentioning that he 
is a very impressive player and deserving of all the praise that he's been getting since he's come to the Nets. And a, a small apology from Nets boy for being so critical about the trade. Just, just a small one. Because like I said, I still think I'm right about why I was upset. But it had nothing to do with James Harden. So I will apologize. I'm sorry, James, on that. Just, just a little bit. But anyway, um, so we're at the All-Star break, and all three of the Nets' big three made the All-Star team. Durant won't play in it. Durant did the uh, All-Star draft, drafted Kyrie first. Of course, he, James Hard he, he, he drafted Harden as well. So they're going to be playing together on the same team. We'll see that. Um, you know, uh, All-Star game is this Sunday three-point shooting contest and the slam dunk kind of skill challenge is all going to be on one night. It's going to be a crazy night. Um, I don't really have a lot to say about that. Um, you know, this is a weird year with COVID and everything going on. So I'm just looking to watch the game and enjoy it. But uh, I'm really just getting more excited about the second half of the season and Durant coming back with Jeff Green and, and see this team continue and then excited about Claxton developing more and so on and so forth and what other players they could add. So, Overall, the first half of the season had a 24 and 13 record. Despite all the emotions that I went through, the ups and downs and everything, I have to give this Nets team an A. Not an A plus because they don't have the best record in the NBA, but based off of what happened, I give what's happened so far this year for the Nets an A. It's not perfect, but it's damn close right now, and it's making this pessimistic, pes pessimistic, pessimistic. Nets fan, <laughs> pessimistic. I, I, words, English. You think I'd be good at it? I'm not. Um, but anyway, you think you make me. Uh, you, it's making me more. I can't talk. It's making me feel better about this team. It's making me more positive about a team. And I've been a negative person my whole life when it comes to the Brooklyn Nets. So, there. Overall, this first half of the season has made me feel better than it has in, ye in the last 20 years of being a Nets fan. So we'll see what happens. We'll see if it continues moving forward. I don't know. That last. Ignore that last two minutes. I don't know what was going on. Anyway, let me know what you guys think about this uh, Nets team, the first half of the season, and, um, and see if, you know, what you think about Claxton – if you believe he should stay in the rotation, even when Green and Durant come back, um, maybe some of the moves they could make. Just overall, what you overall felt about this first half of the year. That's really what this episode was all about, analyzing the first half of the season and so on and so forth. Um, my next Nets Boy episode will probably be right after the All-Star break, and it'll be, you know, my expectations of the second half of the season. And then, I don't know if you've been noticing this, but my 200th episode is coming up right after that. Like, wow, 200 episodes. 200 episodes of me doing this. It's coming up. And I don't know what the hell I'm going to do. <laughs> I don't know yet. Maybe people are welcome to comment and make suggestions. I have a small idea what I'm going to do. But, like, my 100th episode, I did a clip show, which was you know, the best moments of Nets Boy so far. And, and it took me way too long to do. It took me like seven months. That's not true. But I was like like four or five months to watch. We watch almost 100 episodes of Nets Boy and pick and choose my favorite moments and edit it together. Because I remember I had the idea of doing it around like episode like 80. And so I started doing that then. I'm not doing that this time. I'm not doing a clip show of 200 episodes. All right, I don't have enough time for that. But I have a couple ideas of what I might do. I don't want to give anything away, but I'm also open to suggestions. So let me know if you guys want to have a suggestion of what I should do for my 200th episode. Um, I did think about writing a song for my 200th episode. If you noticed, I have not written and performed a song since my Goodbye Brooke song when Brooke Lopez left the Nets three years ago, four years ago. So... Um, I am due for a song. I, I, I'm pretty sure I haven't done it since before my 100th episode. 
So it's been over 100 episodes since I wrote a song on Nets Boy. And uh, I was thinking about maybe writing a song about James Harden because, you know, why not, right? So I might do that for my 200th episode. I might do something else that I have planned for my 200th episode. I might do nothing and just make it a regular episode. I don't know yet. We'll see. Open for suggestions. But until then, keep your eyes open to the next Nets Boy episode, which will probably be, like I said, my expectations of the second half of the season. Enjoy the All-Star game and all the All-Star festivities. And go Nets. I'm pretty pleased. So until next time, this is Nets Boy. Sun and all. Where the